so briefly my outline, I'm going to talk about our, our research question, uh, the approach that we've taken technically. Uh, I'll show you some example images, hopefully to pique your interest a bit be, as I get through the uh, two, two slides of text on results. Um, and then a bit about the, the challenges that we've uh, experienced in developing the, the equipment and in using it on routine surveys. Uh, some examples of the data products that we're able to provide. And then finally, a uh, bit of conclusions and uh, some of the relevance that I see to the uh, session theme. So our basic research question is, can we accomplish the, the principal sampling tasks of a fishery survey underwater? These being count by species and getting individual lengths of these species. Uh, and some thoughts on why we'd want to do this underwater. Uh, we can improve existing surveys. Um, importantly, get more information with the same sampling effort. Uh, we can preserve information on three-dimensional distribution at very, very fine scale. Uh, we can look at patchiness, species and size overlap. Uh, we can reduce the problem of, select of selectivity in the cod end. Uh, with this gear, we're able to sample individuals from cod over a meter long to euphosids, you know, at, at sub-centimeter scales. Uh, we also don't discard our samples when we discard the catch because we have a, a full inventory of all of the images. So it's possible to, in fact, reuse that survey data in completely new ways at later dates. Um, also, things like quality checking um, catch information. Uh, and then I have a couple of thoughts on, on new techniques potentially for future surveys related to doing trawling with an open cod end. Uh, where we would have reduced mortality. Fish are simply released at the same depth that they were captured. Uh, we could do long transect surveys, sort of thinking about the mega transects that are used in terrestrial ecology. Uh, you don't have to worry about your cut end filling. Uh, and also trawling at much higher speeds where you don't have the, uh, the towing resistance of a closed cut end. So the way that we're using the system, uh, replacing the camera system in the aft portion of the trawl uh, between the extension and cod end. And the reason is a uh, problem of scale, that we've operated primarily in pelagic trawls where we're looking at tens of meters scale openings. And we really have a, an effective range in, in the somewhere around three meters with, with um, imaging technology. So if we move the system back into the extension, we're in one to two meter opening and we can get an, an image of everything passing through the trawl. So here's a, an image of uh, the, the system. This was a, from a, a cruise this summer. Uh, on the left side um, is leading back into the cod end. To the right, it would be up towards the, uh, the opening of the trawl. And this is an image taken underwater um, with a towed vehicle just over the system. Again, the, the cod end to the left and the, uh, the trawl opening to the right. So a little bit about the, the technical aspects. The main camera unit is less than a meter long. It weighs 26 kilograms in air and about three kilos in water. Uh, the image on the, on the right is how it's, it's placed in the, the larger deployment frame in the trawl. Uh, we have stereo color cameras, 1.4 megapixels, um, and we collect images at five frames per second, everything time referenced. Uh, and also inside this, the, the main unit is a PC to control the cameras. Uh, it's saving the images. And we also have capacity to have a live feed to the, to the um, vessel. Uh, light is provided by uh, external LED strobes. They give 30,000 lumens of light. That's equivalent to about 35 incandescent 65-watt bulbs. So it is a lot of light that we're introducing, which I know can be of concern, certainly, related to uh, fish behavior. Uh, 2,000-meter uh, depth rating, and we're running it off a battery and can get eight hours of runtime. So some example images. Uh, if you can click on this one, this is actually a video. <coughs> this is running at five frames per second. So this is exactly what the, the data collection looks like. If you were looking at it on the bridge, this is what you would see. Um, here I've compressed four hours of trawling into 31 seconds by removing the time without any fish. So the, the, the range over which uh, we were sampling was 15 to 131 meters, but we know the precise depth 
at which each of these objects passed through. So a bit about the, the results. Um, so we've looked at uh, verifying, well, are we getting the, the same results from the images as we do with standard sampling of the cod end? Uh, so this is an example of nine halls. We had 16 species of fish captured and 1,548 individuals. Um, you can see we were 18 short in our images. Um, and this was a problem with the deployment. There was a small area that was outside of the field of view. Um, so I think a few fish uh, went past. That's something that we've remedied. Um, but overall, um, our area is 1% um, in total count. And then we're also able to measure lengths. Um, and we've tested this in two ways. Uh, the first, we uh, had five fish in a pen and just let them freely swim back and forth in front of the camera over 10 hours. So we know the length of each of these fish. And here we're able to uh, compare the, the mean length from the calculated from the images against the actual length of the fish. You can see for all individuals, we were within 2.3% of the length. Now, when we're working uh, actually on a, on a survey and in a trawl, we can't link an individual fish with an individual image because everything is mixed in the cod end. So here, the approach we've taken is comparing um, length frequency distributions. So in these plots, the uh, hashed lines are what was physically measured from the cod end catch, and the solid line is the, the length frequency distribution calculated from the images. So you can see we get very good fits of the the, the sampled population. Uh, a bit about the challenges. First question that anyone asks is, well, what happens when the water is not clear and you're relying on images? Um, it's actually not as big of a problem as we thought it would be. This is uh, an ex uh, uh, this example image is from a, a monochrome camera, uh, which we had direct lighting. Uh, yeah, so that was not a video. Uh, I don't know if you can make it out, but that blob in the lower right-hand corner is, in fact, a cod which I know because 10 seconds later it passed through our system. Um, the major difference here is that we're using indirect lighting. Um, so I think we're, we're, not, we're not illuminating the particles in the water nearly as much, so we're still able to get very usable images. Uh, certainly a little bit diminished quality, but I can, we can tell that that's an Atlantic cod and I can do a length measurement on it. And we have, in fact, used the system uh, in bottom trough. Um, and they've gotten good images as well. So another challenge, uh, the behavior of fish. We can get very high entrance rates. This is a video, if you could click on it. So here we had about 172 blue whiting passing per second. Uh, but, I mean, it still is possible to, to count the number of individuals with probably some small margin of error. Uh, and there are a large percentage of these indiv individuals where I can see both the snout and tail and calculate a length. Uh, another problem we have is fish that enter the field of view multiple times. You click on this one. So here we had a safe who enjoyed the limelight and for three minutes and 15 seconds kept swimming back <laughs> and forth in front of the camera. This is something that uh, we also probably could remedy by putting a longer extension to the, to the cod end. Or again, if, if we uh, use the, the system with an open cod end, this fish most likely would simply pass out. Uh, so now, the parts that I think are a little bit more exciting, you know, what, what are we able to actually produce? Um, so here is a, a haddock who doesn't look very healthy. Uh, it appears to have evidence of barotrauma. You can see that the eye is distended. Um, there's also, it looks like bleeding inside of the eye. There's scale injury. But if we look, the uh, gray line is the trawl profile. And we haven't brought this fish up to the surface. Uh, but there was considerable commercial fishing activity at the same time. So we think we probably encountered a fish that was discarded from the commercial, um, the commercial trawl fishery. The other thing is uh, that was the only haddock we found. So what, what was this haddock doing up in the water column when we know that the commercial fleet was catching haddock at the seabed? And then another uh, ill haddock uh, has a very large abscess in its lower mandible. And it's obviously a very malnourished fish if you look at the, the, the stomach fullness. 
Uh, the only thing that its stomach contained was krill, and the small flecks that are around it are, in fact, krill. So it was present in this significant krill layer. Uh, we can also look at small objects. I mean, here we're, we're looking at zero group, young of the year fish. So going from tens of centimeter and meter scale, we can look at, at single centimeter scale as well. Uh, upper left-hand corner is, in fact, a Greenland halibut, which is nearly translucent, but we're still able to get good enough images to be able to identify and do length measurements. And it, we're not limited to, to fish. I mean, we can also look at things like jellyfish, um, small crustaceans, krill, amphipods, shrimp. Yes. And then this, uh, I think, is the most exciting of the, the data products, uh, where we can do a, a profile of what came through the trawl during the entire um, haul. So this, the, the top is the sea surface. Gray line, again, is the trawl going down and coming back up. Black line is seabed. So this was going across the continental shelf break in the Norwegian Sea. So we have the time and depth that each fish passed. We can look at species overlap. So you can see that the, the first species that we encountered were um, Atlantic mackerel with a few haddock mixed in. Then we went through a layer, it appears, of safe. Um, Atlantic pearl sides, and then this deeper layer of blue whiting with redfish mixed in. Uh, we can see the passage rates. Here I, I've scaled the markers to actually show the density of fish passing in numbers per second. And this is the part that where I think it gets very interesting. We can look at the acoustic record. And so if I go back again, you can see there's a, a very distinct layer of blue whiting, but there's also some scattering a bit higher in the water column uh, that looks like probably was the safe. So we can really verify the species seen acoustically. Um, and we can measure length all along the way for target strength analysis. For instance, we were in this blue whiting layer for about an hour. Well, we can look at if there were trends in fish size throughout that to be able to better correct for biomass estimates for the acoustic data. So just quickly, conclusions, and what I see is the relevance to this session theme. Uh, we can get a full image record um, of, the, the, of the entire hall that's technically feasible. Um, our measurements of length um, match very well with manual sampling. So we're getting some very new products. And then some questions that I have for the group are sort of what are the survey and assessment needs um, that this data might fill and how might we adapt or design new surveys to utilize this information. And then just acknowledgments. Um, this is worked on as part of my PhD, sponsored by Scantrol, then the Institute of Marine Research, particularly the CRISP Center. Um, I want to thank the program leaders and, and uh, cruise leaders for inviting me on cruises. I think I'm not taking an extra 10% of time, but... Uh, and then the Research Council of Norway through the SFI Industrial PhD Scheme and the uh, University of Bergen.